Welcome. Uh, my name is Matt Brown. I'm the Interim Dean of the College of Hospitality, Retail, and Sport Management. On behalf of the uh, faculty, staff, and students, um, I want to thank you for attending today's uh, Dean's Executive Lecture Series. Um, the Dean's Executive Lecture Series is a way to bring industry leaders to speak to our College of Hospitality, Retail, and Sport Management students, faculty, and invited guests. We bring executives into the classroom so students can hear inspiring messages from groundbreakers in the fields of our, that our college represents. But today's topic for the Dean's uh, Executive Lecture Series is Leadership and Resilience, Creating Success in a Year of Crisis. We will feature three leaders in our industries who creatively found success in some aspect of their business during the pandemic. As you know, uh, due to hardships from COVID-19, um, they're gonna talk about those and share how they were able well, to pivot and find success through innovation, thoughtful leadership, and perseverance, while also emphasizing the importance of diversity and inclusion in the workplace. So now it gives me a great pleasure to introduce our moder moderator of the panel, uh, Professor Sporty Geralds, who serves as our Assistant Dean for Diversity and Inclusion. Sporty, thank you. Well, thank you, Dean Brown. Uh, it's awesome to be here today. Today is just fantastic uh, Carolina day. I, I do want to uh, I learned a long time ago when I was managing uh, coliseums that, that uh, I got to take a lot of credit, but a lot of things happened behind the scenes. So I do want to uh, just thank uh, Colin Crick, Tina Weaver, Kathy Smiling, uh, Katie Daly, Bryony Wardell and her team, uh, Aaron Lucas. Those are, uh, are people who uh, have been teaching uh, SPT, I mean, uh, HR, SM301, uh, and so uh, thanks to everybody for being here today, along with our alumni and uh, our industry partners, as well as our students. So I want to get right into it. Um, got some, a couple of old friends, two old friends, and, and one new friend for sure. Uh, but I want to start off today with, uh, with Cindy. And Cindy, can you tell us a little bit about your journey uh, from USC, you're one of our alumni. Can you tell us how you uh, got to where you're at uh, in the international market centers, uh, as well as some of those things that uh, helped you get to where you are? And I do want you to just share a little bit about international market centers. I didn't know exactly what your business was, but if you could share a little bit of your journey and what uh, international market centers actually are, it would be great. Sure, and thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be back here at the University of South Carolina. And just to talk a little bit about my history, I graduated um, in 1992, and um, I did my internship um, way back with J.C. Penney. And so I did an internship with J.C. Penney. I graduated, and I started with um, a small retailer named J.B. White in their executive training program, which they no, no longer exist. And then I moved to the executive training program with Riches, which is now Macy's. And at that time, they moved all of their executive trainees to Atlanta. And I was excited because it was during the time of the Olympics. And um, I did my training in uh, the stores. I moved up into the buying office. And then I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina. And I then became um, working in the buying office with Belt um, in their Charlotte division. And I did that for a couple of years. And then I moved back to Atlanta and then uh, started working for America Smart at the time in marketing and moved up from marketing into leasing. And then in 2018, America Smart was for, uh, merged with international market centers. And so today I am vice president of leasing. And my job is to um, to sell space for our shows. So to tell you a little bit about international market centers, quite simply, our job is to bring buyers and sellers together in a wholesale marketplace. And so we do that. Uh, we have three um, areas. We are in High Point, we're in Atlanta, and then we are in um, Las Vegas. We have over 20 million square feet. Um, and over that 20 million square feet, we also do over 20 shows per year. And specifically in Atlanta, we have over 7 million square feet and show space along with our trade show um, part of our division where it's just people will come in with booths and pipe and drape. But I'm um, specifically responsible for Atlanta and our gift trade shows and I do permanent leasing. So I do leasing um, 
for three, typically three to five years of leasing. And then we have about four shows a year and then two additional op optional shows in that home industry and gifts. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, Al, I wanna to turn to you. Al, Al Hutchinson is an old friend. We worked together in Charlotte many, many years ago and, and he knows I'm fond of him because I'm probably gonna take some heat for allowing a University of Alabama uh, grad uh, into our, our session today. But Al, uh, if you would, please share with uh, our students, particularly, I'm not sure all of them even understand what uh, visit Baltimore would do, but I do think, for instance, we have some sport management majors who might not realize the possibilities of uh, working in a, a, an organization like yours. I know all of the, all of you guys target sports. Uh, Baltimore has taken the uh, CIAA tournament from the city of Charlotte. So if you could just share real quickly a little bit about your journey and then what visit Baltimore is actually all about. Excellent. And again, thank you, Sporty, for inviting me to the conversation. Thank you, Dean Brown. And look, I know this is Gamecock Nation today, so you guys need to be very gentle with me. I'm in a depressed state today since we took that beating last night. So go easy on me today, please. So thank, thank you for that. I know you'll take it easy on me. But with that, but with that said, uh, I've been in this uh, business now for 29 years, believe it or not. Um, and I'm, I'm considered a destination marketeer. And I got introduced to this business in a blind newspaper ad back in 1992 in my hometown. Knew nothing about destination marketing. Didn't know they'd pay you to sell a city and give you money to travel around the country on, on a city's dime and stay in five-star hotels and, and eat in five-star restaurants and sell a city. That, that's a cool gig. So I, have, I sort of fell in love with this business uh, back in 92, wanted to grow in the business. And so I've been fortunate during my career of 29 years to sell for six different destinations. My hometown, as I mentioned to you, Richmond is where I sort of cut my teeth, got started as a salesperson selling the city, then moved down to Charlotte, North Carolina, where I met Sporty working at the convention center. So I had experience and did that for about four and a half years. And, then I had an opportunity to get into management and sell in the city, moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I was my first uh, director of, and then moved uh, to Virginia Beach. And I was VP of sales and marketing, did that for 13 years in Virginia Beach, really learned the game, had some successes, wanted to become a president and CEO, didn't know when or how, but uh, end up uh, moving down to Mobile, Alabama, president and CEO back in 2014 and was there for two years, two and a half years, I should say, and actually commuted back to Virginia Beach. Once uh, to my family, uh, wanted to get back to the East Coast. And so in 2016, I had the opportunity to uh, interview for the president and CEO position in Baltimore. And so I've been here now for almost five years. But just real quickly, uh, my work is really um, creating the great experience for visitors, for conventioneers, and for sports marketing travelers. When they come to any community, it's about 700 of these organizations around the country. And we're the good housing organization. People to feel good about the city, go to our cool restaurants, enjoy the culture, whether it's a museum, a history visit, um, and also um, use our convention facilities, hotels, convention centers, and, and other attractions. So. We're about people coming to our communities and creating a great experience. So when they come to Baltimore, number one, you need to spend a lot of money. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is you go home and we don't have to educate your kids, give you health insurance, pay your retirement. You go and uh, another visitor will come in and leave the same amount of money, hopefully. So it's really a, a good experience for a community to invite visitors from all across, across the country but they have to come into the community and really have a great experience or they won't come back. And we want you to go back to Columbia, or wherever you live, tell all your family and friends that you have to come to Baltimore. So that's really my job. Uh, I enjoy it totally. And it's a great group of folks who are looking for that kind of opportunity. Thanks, Al. Uh, Peyton, uh, one of my former students. Peyton, can you uh, share uh, with everyone, your journey, you worked at one of the iconic venues 
in our country right out of uh, right out of school. So quickly share with uh, with us how you got to be where you're at in Macon today. Certainly. So I uh, got my start at Red Rocks Amphitheater in Colorado, um, and that was actually an internship that I went for. Um, was able to come on as their interim um, assistant director of marketing communications and that spawned an opportunity to go into sponsorship marketing actually and I did sponsorship marketing for Red Rocks um, and a couple other Denver properties that the city manages um, and then shortly after is when I got my start in Spectra um, so I packed my car and drove from Denver Colorado to Orlando Florida and then I went from Orlando Florida to Costa Mesa California and then I packed my, my car again and I moved from Costa Mesa, California to Macon, Georgia. So I, uh, I don't make short moves. <laughs> I, make, I make cross country moves, um, but I am now the director of marketing at the Centerplex. Um, and so we are just uh, about 75 miles south of where Cindy's at in Atlanta. Um, and we have to manage the Macon Coliseum and the Macon City Auditorium. And going off what Al said, you know, we work hand in hand with our local CVB um, to, you know, put forth our, our spaces um, for folks to come do tournaments or events or um, movie filming, show filmings, perhaps um, the film industry in Georgia is quite large. And so we try to leverage our assets for that too. Thanks, Peyton. One of my all time favorite students always comes back and speaks to my classes. Uh, Cindy, I want to go back to you. And obviously, 2020 was a crazy year. Uh, and I know you mentioned your company was bought out by a private uh, equity company. And, and those people, they have made a lot of money and they're not in the business of not making money. But can you share with us some of the things your company did? Uh, it was unique when we talked uh, last week. I thought that uh, they had really put people, can you share with the, uh, with our audience kind of what your company did related to COVID to keep everybody uh, going? Um, yes, um, so for us, um, so in 2018, we merged with, America's Smart merged with International Market Centers, and then we were also bought by a private equity company, which is Blackstone, and they are a Wall Street company, and they believe strongly in our business. And so we were really um, excited to be able to work with them as we went through this terrible time. And one of the things that they did was um, for the people who had permanent leases, we did rent relief programs for all of our all of our tenants. And over the three cities, we were able to do over $75 million in rent relief. So that helped tremendously in being able to save some of those cities um, who also took part in a lot of the, um, the PPP um, governmental programs as well. So together with that, that kind of pushed them where they can get past the pandemic and start looking toward the future. And then internally within our organization, once we merged, we realized there was some duplication in positions. So early on, we did a reduction in force. And then those um, individuals who stayed like myself, we took a reduction in pay all of last year with the long-term goal of making it through the pandemic and then continuing on and being successful. So that was a lot of what we did during that time. And quite frankly, with customers in, in trade shows, you spend a lot of time on the phone, really talking them through this process on how, how they can make their business work. I mean, you have companies that are doing business that are artisans right out of their garage. And then you have some people with huge, huge square footages, but nobody has gone through something like this. So we spent a lot of time on the phone being empathetic, trying to talk them through and trying to think of innovative ways um, to make sure that we hold customers when the pandemic was over. Cindy, looking back, is there anything you would have done differently? I think that's amazing what you guys done did. Was there anything else that you think you could have done? Yeah, I think personally, I, I wish that I would, right in the beginning, so we're talking March and April of last year, I wish that I would not have probably um, spent so much time with our glass half empty people. It's a customer, the world was going to come to an end during the good days. And so what happens now is really, it's really getting bad. So what we have to do is really 
we believe in trade shows. We believe that we're going to be here. We believe in markets. And so instead of going into that dark place with them, we really had to kind of pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and talk about life beyond the pandemic, because we have every intention of being here. We put a lot of money into our markets in terms of marketing. And one of the other things we did in looking past um, the pandemic is that we started our digital platform, which we always had it in our mind to do a digital platform, but we did it a little bit earlier than we had anticipated. So those customers who did not feel comfortable coming to a physical marketplace, they are still able to do it virtually. And that was huge for us. Great, great. Thank you so much. Peyton, I'm going to shift back down the road a little bit from, uh, from Atlanta down to you. And, and I, Peyton and I, we're, we're buddies and I tease her a lot, but uh, share with us, you were unique in making that, that you really kind of kept the doors open and share with uh, our audience, you know, the, the big show and how all that came together uh, to keep making uh, on the map and, and, and going. Yeah, so um, I'm not sure if any of y'all are familiar with the Go Big Show that came out this year on TBS. Uh, Bert Kreischer was the host. We had Snoop Dogg as one of the judges. Um, and so our, our team here worked diligently, especially with our CVB. Um, and we were able to secure filming um, for five weeks in our venue. And they created a little COVID bubble. Um, anyone who had any sort of reason to be there had to get tested, I think, upwards of three times a week. Um, and so that was something unique that we were able to, again, leverage a huge empty building and they were able to transform it and um, put on something pretty interesting. <laughs> we had snakes and alligators and horses and all sorts of critters and creatures <laughs> in the venue for a while. Um, but part of it too was thinking outside the box um, and you know, one of the things that Spectre is really good at is idea sharing. And 2020 was a year that I think we outdid ourselves when it came to that. Um, coming together with our venues across the country to think about ways that we could um, leverage space. Like that's, that's really what a lot of venues have. They've got this space. And so we were able to not only do, you know, drive in movies and, and drive in concerts um, or do some streaming things, but we were able to leverage our space to do drive through farmers markets or drive through food pickups so that we're able to serve our local communities more, more than we ever have. Um, and so I think the success that you saw in venues um, were them digging in and saying, no, we're still going to be relevant to the communities that we're a part of. It just might look really different and we very well might not make any money doing it. Um, but there's people in need and we can help in the gaps hey, here. I ask you the same question. You're a marketing person. I know you guys always kind of look critically at yourself and how could we have done better? Is there anything in retrospect uh, that, that you would have done differently? Um, I mean, I look back at March and April and was just like, oh, she was cute and naive and she thought we would be back <laughs> in business. So like we postponed shows and I ordered radio spots right off of that. I'm like, I got this, I'm prepared. I'll be ready for the new one. So I think, you know, looking back, that's a little funny, but no, I mean, there's, there was no playbook for what any of us went through or still kind of going through. And I, you know, I think my team decided we were going to use this as an opportunity to, to do a deep dive into clean house and to really look at our systems and what's important to us and what are our values. And so we were able to, to take this gift of time that in this industry, you really don't have much of um, and, and come up with ways that we can work better together, um, that we can build a really good for our full-time and part-time. Um, and so I, you know, I, I really think that this situation was a blessing in a lot of ways. Um, and, and our team was able to really rally with other people in our company. Like, I don't think I'm, would have been as close as I am with folks that are in Wyoming or Arizona or Virginia as I am because we we came together and said, all right, like let's get some collective brain power going and figure out how we can succeed now. Al, I want to shift to you. And I know you're you're the CEO. Uh, and so 
you probably sit even a little bit different place than, than Peyton and, and Cindy do, even though they're, they're managing their respective divisions. I, I know when you're in that seat, people are looking at you for all the answers. And I know none of us really had those answers. Can you share your experience as the uh, CEO and, and what you did from your perspective to keep you know Baltimore relevant and, and kind of pivot in this uh, <laughs> pandemic? Yeah, Sporty, uh, that, that's a great, great question. And um, <clears throat> something that since March of 2020, I've been dealing with on a daily basis. And I think all of us as leaders and those who are on the call, who are aspiring to be leaders, um, you know, I think we're nimble. Uh, words like being patient, uh, we're really all a part of what happened with COVID. And as a, as a senior leader in an organization, I, I think it was extremely important to over communicate with the team. Um, you know, I, we experienced, I had to let 22 full-time people go. I went from an organization of 65 people down to 43. Some of those individuals had been with our organization 20 plus years, their mothers, fathers, children, mortgages. That's a tough conversation to have. And so I think as a leader, one of the things I would encourage everyone to always bring is empathy, bring compassion, and bring thoughtfulness to the table. And as a senior leader, I tell my team all the time, A, I don't have all the answers. B, I'm not a robot, I'm a human. So I feel pain, I hurt just like you do. So let's try to do this together. And so we became tighter as an organization. We would have all staff meetings once a week at the beginning of COVID because I wanted to let my team know I felt their pain. I wanted to have a conversation with them. I talked to my senior team twice a week because any organization, you're only as good as your senior leaders. If your senior leaders don't go, other folks will tend to look at them and question, is the organization really serious about my feelings? So I, I think this, this time period has really thought, taught me to be much more uh, grateful but also bring empathy to the conversation. And, um, you know, it's, it's been helpful. This is a very, very, this has been a, the toughest time period I've ever had as a leader in, in, in my career, because I think Peyton mentioned it, there's no playbook. And anyone who tells you they knew what was gonna happen the middle of March and how to deal with it, they're not telling you the truth. We were building a plane and flying it at the same time. And so this has been a very challenging time period. But I think as leaders, if you embrace the situation, be honest with your teammates, be authentic with your teammates, and they can feel your passion and your concern, you would be better on the other side of this as a leader. And that's the way I try to approach it. Great, great answer, Al. I want to stick with you guys, with, with you for a moment. Uh, give me a real quick answer to this one. Uh, what did you, out of this, is there what one thing did you learn about yourself or one strategy you used to hopefully have started to come out on the other side of this thing? I think the one thing I learned um, is I have to be more patient. Um, so I think COVID has taught me to slow down and be patient. I think the other lesson strategically moving forward is getting all thought leaders in your organization together so, because everyone has a different voice and a different perspective. And I think not just a senior leader, but everywhere in your organization, listen to people. And I think Sporty, that, that's been a very good lesson for me to listen to everybody within your organization. Great. Peyton, what about you? What, what, have, you, what have you learned throughout this experience? So one strategy you used to get through it? Um, I, I agree with Al. I, listening has been huge. Um, and, and making sure that your team all are present and all have space and a place to, to say what they're thinking. Um, everyone's got a different perspective from which they're coming at. Um, and so all of those perspectives are, are valid and necessary to take into consideration. And so, um, yeah, I think slowing down and, and, and listening and you know, this year, I think everyone was able to sort of reestablish some boundaries and priorities. And so 
I'm hopeful of being able to carry that in to when things get back into full swing, um, that we don't lose all of those no, new habits and systems that, that that we've established. Cindy, what about you? I echo everything that they're saying. And also um, for us, I think it was really nice to really be able to do a deep dive into our business. And I think that business was going so well. I mean, Atlanta is a convention city. And so we, we're doing markets, we're doing very well with the conventions coming to Atlanta and we got a little bit complacent. And so that, that complacency can kill you. And so with something like this happening, you really have to do a deep dive into your business. You really have to do a deep dive and figure out, you know, if things are not, are not normal, how can we get better? And so we spent a lot of time, like Al said, um, we had weekly meetings every Monday. We had weekly meetings from three to five talking about business, where we are, customers we've talked to, ideas that we have. So this is probably the most time that we've talked to everybody in the company from senior level executives to you know people who are dealing with our customers on a day-to-day -day basis from registration to people on our docks that are bringing in the product in so we talk to everybody and got it for we can do better as a company so we can get past to the next level cindy i want to i want to stay with you um and you shared with dean for diversity and inclusion in our college is something that's that is important to me, uh, but I want you to share with, I know you took, have taken some leadership in your company with the committees that you're, you're on and chairing and those kinds of things. Can you share how uh, International Market Centers has really kind of made a recommitment uh, to being a diverse uh, organization, some of the things you're doing in that, that space? Yes, um, so last year, it was about June, we developed the diversity and inclusion network. And this is really for us to be able to really take a real good look at where we are as a company. And also, um, what are we doing within our communities to make sure that they have a diverse and inclusive organization. And so um, within the diversity and inclusion or, um, network that is open to employees. And there is a 12 person steering committee and I'm on that steering committee. And we have three pillars within our organization is philanthropic, community, and programming. And those are our focuses. And the model of that, um, of our committee is stronger together, greater when we're equal. And so we just wanna make sure that we are educating, um, empowering, and engaging all of the employees. And so one of the things, and I'm, I'm the chair over our programming committee, and the, one of the things, the first thing that we did was our, our um, CEO, Bob Marisich, and Martin Luther King III, we had a fireside chat with him. It was phenomenal. Just listening to his life, um, his family's life, um, and the importance of social activism and, and equality. And the very first thing we did, and we were able to do that here in Atlanta, but it went out to all of our employees. Um, we did it, of course, over Zoom. And then um, after that, we also have our 15% pledge with marketing and in all of our content channels to make sure that we are um, having um, people of color in all of those, in all of those things, whether that's um, buyers or exhibitors. And then um, the, the program that we did last month was the 21 day challenge on, on equity and social justice. And we did this in partnership with the YWCA. And this is an awesome program. Um, and anybody out there who has an interest, please look up the YWCA. But this started um, with the YWCA in Greater Cleveland and they got it from a book that was written by um, Debbie Irving and um, it's just really talking about um, um, diversity and every day for 21 days in our company, for 21 weekdays in our company, they either had a podcast, um, they had a video and they had an article, something about um, race, something about social injustice, because we wanna teach and when you know better, you do better. And today was our last day. And so we finished the entire program and um, we had over, 225 of our employees to participate because it was voluntary. And so we were really, really about um, the response 
about people coming in every morning at seven o'clock, seeing those emails come in. And then, so we're finished with that one. And then in April, we will have a leadership series with Dr. Um, Professor um, Kendi, who wrote How to Be an Anti-Racist. We're having a um, leadership series on April the 7th with that. And then we're looking at different things we're doing with our employee handbook and also um, continuing education. So it's a work in progress, but we're really, really excited as to where we were last year and where we are today. And then most importantly, with our HR, you know, where the change happens, we're looking at the metrics, you know, um, they're looking at, you know, how we bring people in, um, how we do our recruiting, um, are we recruiting the same places the same way? And that's where we're getting the same result. So we're looking at new ways to do recruiting and everything. So we're really excited about those programs. That's, uh, that's awesome. Uh, Peyton, uh, I don't know if our audience can see your shirt, but I know it's purposeful that you have that shirt on. Uh, can you share with you, so proud of you, Peyton took a, a leadership role with her company and opened up some discussions. Can, can you share, Peyton, you know, what your vision was and how you kind of started that program and, and got people on board to join you? So our timeline sounds really similar to, to Cindy's. Um, and back in June, there was the black box on social media uh, initiative that happened. And it felt like the first time I sort of being called out and called up into this. And so, you know, having a, a personal heart for racial reconciliation and then for social justice, I felt like I could suddenly now really bring it into the, the workplace. Um, and so we started off by having really hard conversations with our staff that we've never had before. Um, you know, Macon is 54% black and our part-time staff is predominantly black. And, you know, all these things are happening with the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And, and uh, we weren't saying anything and our staff was looking to us to say like, we work for you. What do you, like, where are you? And so, um, you know, out of these really hard conversations um, and, some, and some small steps, and I, and I um, emphasize enough to not underestimate the power of a small gesture because it can just be this catalyst for a, a much bigger movement. And so out of that, we formed our Racial Reconciliation and Inclusion Committee, which we sat down and we had focus group conversations with our part-time staff and, and listened and asked them, how are we doing as a management team? Are you feeling supported? Are you feeling seen and valued? And in light of everything that's going on in our community, what's touching us and impacting us, like, are you, do you feel like this is a safe space for you as well? Um, and so we were able to then come alongside what ended up happening from Spectra Corporate where they designated our chief diversity officer um, they established regional champions um, within our company. So I serve for, our, even though I'm in the I'm in the dirty South and I love it, I serve on the Midwest committee um, as a regional champion. And then we've got our local groups that are, are starting to get started. And so fortunately in Macon, you know, we were able to kind of spearhead this um, with the initiatives that we were doing and able to align with corporate's three pillars of workforce, workplace, marketplace, um, which essentially is recruitment, retention, and then the development of the staff that you have. Um, and so just like Cindy was saying, really taking a deep dive into our, our job recruiting techniques. Um, so a few of our folks are, are working on establishing really solid relationships with HBCUs in all of our areas to make sure that we are, are in fact pulling from a wider diverse into the same part um, for jobs to make sure our job language is inclusive. Um, and our company was able to form uh, prior, gosh, about a year and a half ago now, we started our women's network um, and we have a book club and that book club we've elected to, to read Austin Chain and Brown and to read Hood Feminism and to make sure that we're um, as women supporting our BIPOC community. Um, and then we also started our pride ERG, which is um, making sure that we're aligning and, and, and creating safe spaces for the LGBTQ community 
um, in our company. And so um, it's, it was that cleaning house. It was that time that 2020 gave us to really dig in and say, hmm, we don't look good here. <laughs> and so let's fix this. Like, let's make sure our actions are aligning with our values. Um, and I think we're off to, to a good start. Um, to be honest, 2020 is a little late to come to the party, but, you know, better late than never. Great, great. Thank you, Peyton. Uh, Al, I want to uh, go to go to you again as the CEO. I, I know you have the ability and I know we, when we talk about it, you really put some thought into how you could leverage uh, contracts and things like that to make people more aware of how they could, could make things better for people. Can you share some of those strategies you used with Visit Baltimore? Yes, sir. And so, again, I, I definitely salute both Peyton and Cindy. You, you guys are doing some great piece and should be commended for that. Um, we approached it very similar. Um, we had a, a situation last summer in one of our local restaurants um, here in Baltimore City. You know, we're predominantly African-American city, 53, about 53% uh, African-American. Um, and um, a young black uh, boy was um, not treated well in a, a restaurant and that restaurant owner sits on my board and uh, who happens to be a white gentleman. And uh, I went to him with my board chair at that time and said, look, what are you all looking at doing to eradicate that situation? And he shared with me some of his steps and we took it a little further. We said, look, we need to create a welcoming environment as a city for all people. Um, and so I challenged him and says, we want to do a diversity, equity, inclusion training for the hospitality industry, senior leaders. And, and we were 100 leaders, but I need you to pay for it. And he agreed to pay for it. We hired a facilitator. He sent his senior leadership team, including himself, went through the training. And so we did a six part training in September of last year that went exceptionally well. And from that, we started building on at your hiring practices, looking at who you spend your money with, um, what your board representation look like. And then we, the same facilitator that we hired, we brought her and her team in to train Visit Baltimore's team because I wanted to make sure our team understood terms like white supremacy, um, terms that are just thrown at us and we don't really think about or understand. So we went through a four part training for Visit Baltimore's team. And then we trained our board um, to some of these issues that all of us are dealing with in this social justice space. So I would say, um, Sporty, that I think it has to be strategic, but I think it also has to be authentic when you approach this topic. It's very complex. And when you look at it from an American filter, this is a 400 year old issue. So when you, when you think about the virus that we've been dealing with for a year, we got the worst disease of racism we've been doing dealing with for 400 years and we've just kicked the can down the road. So I think it's, it's, it's on us now to really, it's great we have in these conversations about diversity, equity, inclusion and great uh, programming and that people have in place. My only concern is that we don't stop. That as businesses reopen, we get back to work, we get busy taking son and daughter to soccer practice, doing what we do, but then we forget about this issue. And so I would encourage all of us who are on this call to continue to push your organizations. And I would employ all of my white friends to join us in this call. This it cannot be just done by people of color. It's gonna take white, good white thinking folks to help us and to shut down. When you, when you hear something, you see something, you gotta shut it down. And I think that that's the piece of the puzzle that I think is still the most challenging that it's going to take off to fix this, not just one community. So we're, we're very strategic, sporty, as we go about putting things in place. We want to have some, some ROI. Where are we now with hiring? But a year from now, we should be better. Where are we now with spending our money with, with BIPOC communities? But where are we 12 months from now? So I have to be put to this to make sure you can... Um, Put some criteria to it and and hold yourself accountable moving down the road great great thoughts uh al and thanks for reminding people that uh, we're all in this together we need our white friends and colleagues 
beings and uh, for brothers to to help all of us be better. Um, I, I do want to acknowledge that we do have some students. I see a couple of my former students, Josh, uh, one of my, my good students from many years ago, Josh Berenger, he's up in the Baltimore area. And I do think uh, we talked about it earlier, students, if you have some questions, uh, our panel have agreed that we will get those questions uh, to them. If we don't get to get those questions answered today, uh, we'll get them uh, to them through email and they'll uh, send you a, a response to your question. Uh, but kind of one of the questions we had and one that I had on my list, um, it, it, it talks about this whole idea of professional development and, and kind of the basis for this uh, call that we're on today. And so Cindy, can you talk a little bit about uh, the role of mentors in your uh, development, how you've gotten to, if you've had any, I know it's maybe been lonely sometimes as the only African-American female in the space, but can you talk about people who have helped you? Uh, get yes, to where I you're think at? it's like so, so important to have a mentor. And, and what I consider for me to have a mentor is someone that will be there to help me even when I leave that job. So it's a, it's a mentor throughout my entire career. So when I situations um, in my career, I can still go back to that person. And I have a couple of different mentors in, in different industries. Um, one man and as well, a different perspective on things that I'm doing, but I cannot impress you enough that when you're in an organization and you see someone in the organization that exhibits all of the skills and the ideas that you have and you want and you want to grow, reach out to that person you want to be your mentor. Um, a lot of times they don't necessarily have to be in the same industry, but what you're looking for is a person that has those same characteristics that you want to exhibit that can take you to the next level into your career. And you can bounce ideas off of during the lifespan of your career. And, and I see people in particular that can call up at any time. And, and you want that person to tell you the good and the bad because we can always do better and we're looking for constructive criticism so that we can get better. And that's just been so important to me in my career that I, I can't even um, describe it. I will tell you, when I graduated from the University of South Carolina, um, I started out with um, J.B. Whites and um, it just not, it was not a good fit. It was not what I wanted to do. I really wanted to be in Atlanta and I really wanted to work for Riches at the time. Now it's Macy's. And I actually reached back um, to Kitty Strickland, who was a professor there at the time at the University of South Carolina, because I made those connections while I was on campus. So I um, reached back to her, and she was able to get the interview for me to interview with Riches, and which, is, which again started my entire career in Atlanta. So what I would say to all of the students out there, please, please make sure if you do nothing else, make sure you network. Network is probably one of the most important things that you can do because what it does is it allows people to talk your name up when you're not in the room. And so I just find it to be something that I always tell people that I wish I would have done more of when I was graduating um, to, to network. And so those students on the call that are sophomores, juniors, and seniors, and you're thinking, how can I network? Well, one way to network is in the college that you're in right now, Every professor should know who you are, and not just by email, but by face. So you should be introducing yourself to those professors so that when something comes across their desk, whether it's an internship, whether it's other opportunities, that you name that they think of. So that is the one thing that I've learned, the power of touring and the power of networking. That can really, really take you places. Awesome. Very, very good advice. Peyton, uh, you know, as I said, we, we stay connected. I, I always look forward on the holidays. Peyton is always intentional about sending Professor Gerald a, a holiday card. So talk a little bit about uh, how you're very intentional about networking and, and those relationships, how you keep those in place. Yeah, you don't underestimate that Christmas card list. Um, um, I mean, really what Cindy said, you know, as a student, you can feel like, I like, how do I know the people in the industry? But 
every internship that you do, every class that you take, that's you're meeting someone in this industry. And it's about relationship building. So please do not go into this saying, oh, Mr. Gerald, I took one class with him. He's going to help me get a job when he has to scroll back through his class list and see when he had you. Like, that's not what we're talking about. Um, your, your mentorship and your networking is a two-way street. It goes both ways. You should be pouring into these people's lives just as much as they're pouring into yours. And the benefit that you have of being a student right now is you have professors who are literally dedicating their lives to pouring into you, to making you as successful as you possibly can be in the industry that you're looking to get into. And so take advantage of that, get to know them, find out, you know, what they did before they walked into the classroom, what their story is um, and who they know. And having those authentic relationships are, are going to come in handy, just like Cindy said, to call on someone who she had a relationship with, who could vouch for her and help her get a foot in the door. Because so much of our industry is your name being said when you're not in the room and someone vouching for you um, with, a, with a colleague of theirs. Um, so uh, yeah, just again, pour, pour into these, um, these folks that you're meeting right now. Peyton, great answer. And I, I can share with you last week, I got a, an email from a student who took a class uh, with me in 2012 with a contact with someone uh, in Charlotte. And I'm like, I have no idea who this person is. So stay connected, be a friend before you need a friend. Al, I wanna finish up with you. Obviously you're in the big, uh, a city. And you know, I felt like uh, me just giving you one phone call, one text saying, hey, will you participate on this panel? You said, sure, I'm, I'm all in. Uh, but it, it does speak a lot about relationships. Can you finish us up with, with who's been important to you throughout your career and the value of those relationships, particularly as it relates to you being able to be effective as a CEO of a, of a community like Baltimore? Well, Sporty, I mean, you wanted, you one of those guys who I was able to develop a relationship with and relationships are, um, and it's, uh, you know, pick up the phone, you email, you text someone, they should be able to get right back to you. That, that shows how connected you are to folks. And I think gotten away though, from this face-to-face -face contact, right? We're so reliant on technology that I think, uh, you know, building those relationships will be so critical as you move forward. And really what it gets to from why relationships are so important, it's really about your personal brand. You know, I, I use an example, what, what is your Nike swoosh? Or I'm in Baltimore, so I better say, what is your Under Armour UA? What, what, in other words, what's your it factor? What makes you so special that I won't forget you? that I can remember you regardless. And I think that comes with, at the beginning of developing these authentic relationships, being curious, asking very intentional questions of folks that you meet, your professor, um, another colleague, another person who looks different from you, talks different than you. I think we have to enter relationships from a place of curiosity, but being real, right? Authentic curiosity. And as you do that, the dividends on the other side, the output, you don't even know what that looks like. But if you put the time in on the front end with genuinely wanting to get to know someone and concerned about them and, and their thinking may be different, but understanding their perspective, relationships has been the key to my career throughout. Everywhere I've gone, someone has helped Al to get that next position. I encourage all the folks on this call to take time to build relationships. Sometimes it, it might be challenging and, 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 and takes a while, but the, the, the benefits of it are just unbelievable. Getting to know a person and, they, and them getting to know you, I think is invaluable throughout your career. So I think we, we're about at the end of our time here, uh, but we got one, one final question that's a quickie and, and hopefully you've thought about this a little bit. Uh, but if you could have a billboard uh, anywhere in the world, uh, what would you have on that billboard? What advice would you give people on your billboard? 
That's a great question. <laughs> um, if I could have a billboard, um, I am enough. Very simply. And the reason why I choose that is because so many times we will get into a room and because I'm in sales, we start comparing. And in your head, you start, you start comparing to this person went to this school, they did this, they did that. But what we have to remember is that all of the things that we've done to get to where we are. Now, I'm not saying being cocky. I'm not saying that there's not still room to learn. But what I am saying is I am enough and I'm going to a top level school, which is the University of South Carolina. I am at a premier college. Um, in the college that you're in studying um, retailing, studying sports management, you're in the top of the game. So you tools. Now, all, all you have to do is tools to get to the next level. So again, I am enough. I just have to put it into practice. What an awesome answer. We're going to send and use that as our, our marketing uh, campaign. Great, <laughs> great answer. Uh, speaking of marketing, Peyton, can you share? Share what you, that big show. I know you got that big show, but what would that big uh, billboard uh, say from Peyton Jeter? My sassy answer is keep your hands to yourself because a lot of people didn't hear that. But my my uh, motivating answer is you can do hard things. Um, I think you just have to remind you can do hard things. Well, that that's. Awesome. And uh, uh, the game a long time, my friend, uh, your parent, your uh, professional, you got probably a lot of wisdom stored up. What would your billboard take? Well, I'll keep it real simple. I would put love, respect, and peace. All right. Well, folks, at the time here, I just, it's been so insightful, great commentary, great thoughts. Uh, uh, we always miss, but that's the sign of a great uh, event is people want more at the end. We, we want them to want more. So uh, on behalf of our college and, and Dean Brown and our Cindy, thank you so much, uh, Peyton. You know how much I think of you and Al. Uh, just awesome to be reconnected with you, my friend. Uh, with that, I think uh, we're finished for today. Good luck. You guys stay safe out there. Uh, for our students, continue to work hard as we finish up the semester.